Um, I am Greg Petoniak, the CEO of Semca Michigan Works and a former state legislator, by the way. And I would like to welcome you to today's panel discussion regarding the impact of the state budget on workforce development. This panel is being recorded and made available for those who were not able to attend today. Before we begin our discussion, let me introduce our panel members. Senator Rosemary Bayer represents Michigan's Senate District 12 in Oakland County. In 2018, Rosemary was successfully ran for the seat uh, to her first run as an elected position. Prior to joining the Michigan Senate, um, Rosemary had a successful career in the fast moving and innovative field of um, information technology, starting as a computer engineer and analyst, finding and inventing projects, products to solve real business problems. She was the co-founder and chief inspiration officer of Ardent Cause L3C, a database technology company serving nonprofit organizations with database products and services. As chief in inspiration officer, she motivated the internal team as well as external collaborators to use technology innovation to move forward together. Rosemary was also co-founder of the Michigan Council of Women in Technology, serving in leadership and volunteer roles for more than a decade. She also worked for Sun Microsystems for 15 years and served as, as and, and also worked for Sun Run Microsystems and served as a systems engineer for control data in Amdahl corporations. Rosemary earned a bachelor's degree in computer science and math from Central Michigan University and an MBA with distinction from Lawrence Technological University. Welcome, Senator. I would also then like to um, introduce George Cook. He is the Director of Legislative Affairs for the Office of Governor Gretchen Whitmer. In this role, he serves as the day-to-day -day lobbyist for the governor. Prior to joining the governor's office in October, 2020, George spent over nine years in government affairs for Toyota North, North America, where he was a registered lobbyist from 2015 to 2018. His special in public policy work for Toyota included a focus on advanced technologies, vehicle technologies, safety and infrastructure policy, dealer franchise laws, and workforce development policy. Before joining Toyota, George spent six years working in state government affairs for the Alliance of Automobile Manufacturers in the Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration Institute trade group for HVAC manufacturers. He got a start in politics as an aide in the Ohio Senate. George earned a bachelor's degree in political science from Kenyon College and a master's in public administration from Central Michigan University and a master's in management sciences from Troy University. We, I also would like to introduce um, uh, our, an, another panelist, Representative Greg Van Workum, who was elected in 2018 as a state representative for Michigan's 91st district encompassing part of Muskegon County. Greg was the district director for US Representative Bill Huizenga and previously served as a senior policy advisor to US Representative Pete Hoekstra. He serves as the chair of the Appropriations Subcommittee on General Government and the vice chair of the Government Operations Committee. Greg is also a member of the Muskegon Rotary Club and Covent Life Church. He earned a bachelor's degree from Calvin College and a master's degree in political leadership from George Washington University. Today's discussion is part of a series of panels taking place throughout April in recognition of the Michigan Works Association Workforce Advocacy Month. We hope to bring you an informative and spirited discussion today. Let's start the discussion with a question for Senator Rosemary Bayer. Senator, in response to the governor's fiscal year 2022 proposal, budget proposal, you specifically called out support for some of her recommendations to support K-12 education in affordable chi child care. Why do you believe these particular issues are so important? Well, I mean, it obviously starts there, right? It all starts there. Let's start, let's talk a little bit about child care first. And, you know, over the pandemic this past year, if we didn't realize how important childcare was before, we certainly do now, right? We have understand much better that without childcare, people can't get to work. Without childcare, even people who are working at home can't work because there's a kid there all the time, right? I mean, they're teaching, they're babysitting, they're doing whatever they need to do, clearly impacting productivity in all kinds of ways. So childcare 
is a critical industry and we just didn't used to see it that way. So um, in addition to just needing a way for your children to be cared for while you work or so you can work, many times people, because we have a problem with wages across the country, including Michigan, um, you're spending 20 or 30 or even up to 50% of your income on childcare, the motivation to work is harder to find, right? That is really tough. If you have a couple kids, that is a huge impact on a low income salaried person. A pers I mean, a person who works hourly. Um, so I did work hard actually on some budget things having to do with childcare and K-12. Um, they are obviously in my sphere that I literally work on in committees, but worked on it in advance with folks in the department and in the governor's office because we needed to make it more accessible for families to increase the eligibility. It, so now with what the governor proposed, we would get families up to 200% of the federal poverty level in income, which means a family making anything below $54,000 a year can get fully subsidized healthcare. That can make a huge difference in what people can do in their, in their work, right? And being able to go to work and have a good job and have maybe even only one job instead of having to work two, which also impacts their ability to take care of their kids. Um, but we also worked on ways to improve uh, the efficiency and the cost model, raising the wage and the opportunity to raise wages for childcare workers. They have been undervalued forever. And so just, just by what we know now, we're raising, we put in the proposed budget and mostly this has been agreed to in the Senate budget. Um, hopefully it'll come out of the, the budget that comes out of the legislature as a whole to raise the wages, raise the, the uh, money that goes into the providers, smooth out their operations with a different way to do enrollment. This can make everything easier for families therefore easier for our people to go to work. So that's the first step. The second step is K-12. And this is our foundation, right? Our foundation for our workforce. Right now, we are sitting around 20% of the adults in the state are functionally illiterate. And there's hard to think of jobs where you can actually get even training for them if you can't read and use a computer, right? I mean, we are gotten to that point. So the fact that we have such a huge number of people in the state that are functioning that tells us that we need to up the game here in education. And what's been happening for us in the last 20 years, we have been underfunding to the point where we're now actually funding our schools at 2002 levels. We are at the bottom, 50th of 50 states in keeping up with rates of uh, inflation, keeping up with the cost of education actually increasing, not at all, our rate of uh, funding for, for public education. So that loss, anyone who has a kid, anyone who's involved or talks to people who have a kid or anywhere involved with education, you know the things we have lost, right? Besides art and, and, math and, and uh, music and sports and you know, all of those things that we may think of, shop class, we, we lost all of that, but we also lost anything we had when it had to do with achievement. So when you look at standard test scores, they have dropped to the floor, whereas we 20 years ago used to be up near the top. And that is directly aligned with our funding model. So we need more funding applied to K-12 education. So the governor's pro uh, proposal up to that and the Senate proposal actually up to even a little bit more. So that's a positive spin. And in addition to that, we need to fund equitably to make sure that all students in Michigan get access to a good education. And some students, their disabilities, their location, if you're rural or low income, there are different reasons why it may be a higher rate needed for you. We need to do that too. So those are the, that's the battle that we're working on now. The governor is all in, continues to put ways to make it more equitable every year. It's an ongoing challenge in the legislature, but we will keep fighting that because those things are the things that are gonna get us more funding, equitable funding, both things. We need both things. That will get us to the point where people coming out of high school are ready for programs that will advance their career, whether it's a technical trade, whether it's college, whatever it is that's next for them, they will be ready to go, be able to read, be able to write, be able to use a computer, all that stuff we need for the new jobs. 
Well, thank you, Senator. Very in, in, informative and uh, you're very much in alignment, I can assure you, with Michigan Works mindset on, on both the topics of ch child care and, and um, K-12 education. Um, I'd like to now ask and introduce uh, Representative uh, Greg Van Workum and welcome uh, Representative. Um, in, in continuing on the topic of child care, uh, affordable child care was a serious issue for Michigan re residents prior to the pandemic, but has become even more problematic over the course of the crisis. I understand you and the Grand Rapids Chamber of Commerce led a bipartisan coalition to support funding for the TriShare program. Can you briefly describe the TriShare program and why it is so important and what made you decide to support it? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of your panel. Um, child care was an issue that was kind of on top of my mind coming into the legislature. Uh, you might hear them as they're all playing upstairs right now uh, as the kids don't uh, have school for teacher training uh, today. Um, but uh, I'm father of three young kids and we've had that discussion at the, the, the dinner table of whether it made sense for both of us to continue to work uh, or one of us to stay home and, and raise the kids. Because when you looked at it and looked at the cost, um, it was basically one of us was basically paying for, for childcare, working for childcare. And then when I met with all the employers in my district, particularly the manufacturers, the three issues that always came up was as a barrier to get people to work. And this is when we were at full, full employment, right? Um, having the skill uh, they needed for the job, reliable transportation and childcare. Uh, and I know certainly through my work uh, on the congressional level, there are plenty of programs out there for helping train workers and a lot of businesses are willing to pay for that training. They need somebody to consistently come in, in the door. Uh, there's programs around town also for, for transportation. What was lacking was that childcare element and what that was becoming, how that was being a burden on, on families. So it was an issue I came in and wanted to do something. We built a coalition with the Grand Rapids Chamber, but certainly with um, the governor's office, uh, a lot of the stakeholders uh, from the area uh, that have been involved in this space. And we came up with a, a tri-share model. Um, one, because I, I don't believe there's enough taxpayer dollars to solve this issue. Uh, and I don't think that's necessarily the right direction either. And it's an employment issue. And there were so many employers that are saying they would be willing to help because they need that talent in there. There is, pro there is a very talented workforce uh, out there, particularly women that after having the first or second child who have long worked have now decided to, to stay out and, and, and probably would consider working uh, if, if childcare was more affordable. So the TriShare program is, uh, you have the state dollars that continue, that the Senator mentioned that uh, the, is passed on through the federal government with the child, de child care Development Block Grant. So we already have kind of that pot of money. Uh, you got the personal, people are still putting their own dollars in. What we thought was missing was some of that employment dollars. Um, so we kind of came up with a plan that is based on a facilitator because we hear from providers of just the difficulty of managing uh, the bureaucracy with LARA, MDE, DHHS, um, that all the paperwork, all the compliance, all the things also of having consistently having kids there. Um, we hear that from employers too, is they would, some have tried to get in the space and just realize that that's not their ballywick. That is not what they're designed to do. So what we want to do is create basically a facilitator hub, somebody that is focused on this, that can help the providers with compliance, can help the employers with finding slots for their employees' kids, and then helping with um, the parents finding places for, for their kids to go. And try and consolidate that, smooth it, um, so that it's kind of like a one-stop sh one shop center for people and very localized too. 
So right now we got funding last, um, last term to do three pilot projects. We got one here in Muskegon, uh, one in Northwest Traverse City area, and one in Saginaw. And we have them kind of as a urban one, a rural one, kind of suburban one that we can test these out and see what works for each area because it's very different uh, what we have here in Muskegon to what you may have in Menominee, what you may have in Macomb, what you may have in Monroe. It doesn't really work to just have one statewide program. So we want to kind of figure some of these out, um, see what works for each local area, but try something different because a lot of these big issue, big problem, um, um, top, top of mind issues just can't be solved by sending more money. You got to kind of look at this, see if there's some innovation there. Uh, get businesses engaged. We think one of the other things of having businesses and employers engaged here will be now that there's some skin in game for them, that that will actually help improve the quality of care at child care as well. Uh, I give the example of um, uh, a, a home daycare that it just has SpongeBob on all day. You know, if you, a parent starts saying, hey, have issue that all my kids doing is watching SpongeBob all day. And all of a sudden the employer says, well, maybe we won't be supporting that one anymore. Maybe we need to look at different ones. It just, I think now adds even another layer of accountability uh, to the system, which will drive up uh, the cost or drive up uh, the quality of care as well. So it's a, it's a new pilot program. We started it uh, last year. The, the, the three pilots were selected a couple months ago. And I think at the end of this month or so will be kind of the first payment. So we'll be starting to collect the data on seeing if we've got a, a model that works here in Michigan. Thank you, Representative, for that thorough overview. It sounds like a promising program. And I can tell you, um, I, I'm envious for the, the pilot regions because indeed childcare quality and availability in, in costs is an extremely serious issue for our workforce and in assisting both our employers and workers. Thank you very much. Now let's turn to George Cook, the Director of Legislative Affairs for Governor Gretchen Whit Whitmer. Welcome, George. Um, Michigan Works is a big supporter of the Governor's 60 by 30 goal, as well as features for frontliners and Michigan Reconnect. Why are these initiatives so important to Michigan's economic recovery post pandemic? Well, first and foremost, thank you for the question and thank you to everybody for having me here today. I do really appreciate it. I have to say, I'm, I'm like a representative Van Workham. I have four kids running around here now through this pandemic and uh, to his point, lots of noise upstairs and all around. So I'm very glad no one's rushed in and jumped on camera as of yet. And I may have to be taking advantage of your TriShare programs with that going on, Representative. So, but good work there and great leadership. Uh, you know, for these programs, I, I, it made me think of what uh, Senator Baer was speaking about, uh, being a chief inspiration officer, because I think programs like this are inspiration for the state, they're inspiration of people to get better, to do better, to do more, and uh, good opportunities to recognize people uh, for that. So. We all know that Michigan's ability to remain economically competitive is increasing in this increasingly competitive world is really reliant on our increased post-secondary education attainment uh, for our citizens. So be that a college degree or professional credential, something along those lines. And that's why Governor Whitmer set a goal of having 60% of our workforce holding some type of post-secondary credential by 2030. We think that's very important. The only way we're gonna to get to that 60% number is by increasing our current rate of post-secondary credential attainment. Uh, that is critical. So reconnect and futures for frontliners are huge parts of that effort because they reduce the financial barriers uh, for folks to get that associate's degree or to get those industry credentials. Right now, there are about 15,000 futures for frontliners participants who've enrolled in community college. And that's amazing. Uh, it's just a great uh, step there and it's a high number and you know, potentially there's more to be had there. So uh, I also think it's really, really important uh, today and going forward to recognize all of those who have worked really, really hard through this pandemic as frontline workers. Um, so we have folks out there, we need to recognize 
who were parts of, of essential industries and who showed up to work every day throughout this pandemic to keep the world going. We're talking about you know, folks that are staffing hospitals and nursing homes, stocking shelves at grocery stores, providing childcare uh, to critical infrastructure workers, as we've noted how important that is to keep those things going, manufacturing PPE, protecting public safety, picking up the trash, delivering supplies, or even our mail. These are all things that have kept us moving forward and keeping us going throughout this pandemic. So we owe folks that opportunity and uh, these kind of programs make it possible for that to be true. Very helpful um, insights, George. Those are great programs um, you know, that the governor has conceived here. And, and it's great to see the strong bipartisan support. You know, I, I'd like to say that workforce development often enjoys strong bipartisan support as a, in a policy arena. And um, it's proving true here in Michigan as both of those programs, Frontliners and My Reconnect have, have been supported by both parties, which is outstanding. And, and both have been involved in in perfecting and creating them. So that's wonderful. Um, George, does the governor's budget proposal uh, for this year provide additional support for these programs? Uh, it does, yes. So there's three things that we're looking at that we put forward, and that would be a one-time investment of $120 million in the ReConnect program. Uh, we're also requesting $60 million for an expansion of futures for frontliners, and then $12 million for those really, really critical wraparound support services. You know, those support services are important because we know from the experiences of Tennessee and other places that the biggest reason people don't finish these programs isn't because of the academics, but because of the issues uh, outside of the classroom. And that's been touched on uh, by Representative Van Wert and by Senator Baer, how important it is to have that support system there in place for folks to be able to get their educations to go to work. So uh, as we talk about all of these things, again, putting that good focus on the support services, the wraparound services is important. Very good, very good. So um, let's focus on some questions now that, uh, that I'll throw out for the entire panel. So the Going Pro Talent Fund is one of the most effective resources available to address the state's talent crisis and is a huge priority for Michigan Works to ensure funding for this program is not only continued but increased. The governor rec recommended $43 million, for, $43 million for fiscal year 2022 but we would like to see an amount of funding be bumped up to 55 million, which would put funding in line with the annual demand. What can we do to get this funding increased? I would say, you know, uh, my, my perspective would be first and foremost, you know, continue to be strong advocates for, of the program, which you are, and we appreciate that. Uh, but, you know, did want to say, you know, put it in perspective, the amount of funding that was put forward by the governor that would have funded everybody, every eligible applicant from last year at that stage. So if there's growth in the program or something along, the, along those lines, we may need that critical bump there. But we do think that the funding put forward uh, can support the program. Senator? I do have a comment. When I first came in, I was, uh, I'd, I'd never heard of Going Pro. And uh, the first time I heard of it was one of the companies in my district called me up and said, hey, come and visit. We wanna show you our place and talk to you all about what we're doing. And they introduced me to Going Pro and how critical is one of the auto suppliers in the Northern part of my district, how critical that has been for them, right? For you making sure that they have people that are trained and, and doing the things that are needed because the, all industry changes so fast anymore. Just keeping up with the rate of change requires constant training and that's all there is to it. So, um, I think that was the, the most compelling message for me. And I know that I've heard from others since then, right? This is, besides you guys, I know how important it is to Michigan Works, but other employers and what they're actually doing. And so by having um, the people that benefit, the companies that benefit and the employees that benefit by the programs tell us about it, that's a huge way to garner support, you know? Thank you, Senator. Uh, Representative, did you have any comments? Yeah, we've certainly have heard of the successes with Going Pro. Um, I'm trying to recall kind of the history, but it is about three, three, four year old program now. And I think maybe one year, uh, some of those funds were, were reduced. Um, it's, 
it certainly doesn't go without its controversy. I, I know kind of speaking to a particular crowd here uh, that, that supports it and works with it, um, but it doesn't go without some controversy of some businesses getting the dollars, other businesses not, what role um, an employer has with that. But uh, we've seen, as, as the Senator was saying, we, we have seen the, the benefit, uh, the popularity of the program um, right now, a lot of the focus is keeping our businesses open right now. Um, a lot of businesses are struggling throughout the state. How do we focus on making sure they're open, they're in compliance, they're opening safely. Uh, we understand the need for the continued investment in, in our skill set, um, but we've got a lot of, a lot of things to balance right now. Um, particularly the small business side and, and the impact some of these um, orders have had on them, just what the business environment is right now. So as legislators, when we look at the workforce development stuff, and if you work the LEO budget, which is uh, in the general government, you still have to consider all these different levers that are being placed on our economy right now and trying to understand where those priorities need to be. Greg, do you mind if I just say one more thing? I know it's out of turn already, but that's me always. I'm sorry. Um, so I just, I have had two meetings this morning already about the electrification um, of automotive specifically. So. Um, I have a, a relatively new company in the northern part of my district. It's a small business, but they are totally focused on batteries. And, and so that work is critical to what's next. So I think one of the things, and this is a big opportunity for Michigan Works and for other, other things that the state's involved with, but um, we, you know, we've had a long conversation about where are we going to get the engineers, where are we going to get the technicians who have the skills to move to this thing that we are driving to, right? In many ways, we're driving to it in the building industry, we're driving to it in automotive. I mean, it's gonna become a huge part of our state's infrastructure and an opportunity for us to lead in another way, right? So it's, it, you know, and this is the big challenge and Representative uh, Van Workham is correct. We have to deal with the current situation always. And yet it's also our job to look to the future and that's not even a distant future. That's like a, a future that we need right now. <laughs> so it's a balance and it's a struggle, but it's also a really big opportunity, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, in, oh, go ahead, Representative. And I know we're talking particularly on the workforce development side, and um, I'm sure there'll be more questions about this as well. Um, but, you know, again, I, I work the, uh, the, the Department of Labor Economic Opportunity Budget um, I'm not on the higher ed budget, but a lot of that, you got to consider that as well as an element to this as we're preparing our state. And I think that goes to the governor's, uh, is it 60 by 30 uh, program as well. Um, we are investing as well in our higher education system. So there's lots of different um, programs that are trying to get our workforce to where it needs to be for the future. Yeah. True. Very good. And I truly appreciate the fact that there's a lot to balance, particularly in the context of this pandemic. You know, what's interesting for us at Michigan Works is that the biggest issue 15 months ago in our world was meeting the talent shortage and the talent gap. And then the pandemic hit. And um, frankly, the talent shortage and talent gap hasn't vanished, right? It's still there, maybe even exacerbated. And um, one good thing about, or, or, or not, one, but there are many good things about going pro talent funded, but to indicate to you both is that we find it to be very flexible um, and, and fairly easy for to work with employers on all things considered in, in our world. And so um, in, in one solution to making sure those that get turned down get, get funded is to increase the funding. So I had to slip that in there, sorry about that. <laughs> all right, um, let me move on to the the next question, which is over the past year, the Michigan Works Network has stepped up to assist Michigan Unemployment Insurance Agency with over 1.25 million phone calls, producing positive results for hundreds of thousands of Michiganders. Currently, the work registration requirement at Michigan Works is waived due to the pandemic. 
As Michigan Work seeks to focus on its primary mission of reemployment and training, we'd like to codify in state statute a requirement for individuals to register with Michigan Works in person or virtually within 21 days of filing for UIA benefits. What UIA reforms is the legislature considering, if any? Um, I, I'm probably not speaking out of turn for the Senator, but I'm guessing she's, her office has been inundated by uh, unemployment camp claims over the uh, past uh, 13 months here um, and is really putting a focus on uh, the Unemployment Insurance Agency. Um, and I guess one of the issues is the short term. There is still a, a significant backlog of people that are waiting on claims that have been waiting for months for their claims. Uh, we've heard several reasons why. Um, we've also heard that Michigan's system is one of the most um, impacted by fraud over this time. So when you, when you bring that topic up, those are the two things that really come to my mind of how do we now get a system that one is works efficiently for the people that is supposed to serve. People that are in dire situations, having difficulty putting food on the table, keeping rent payments up, house payments up. How do you quickly allow that to happen? So I think we're gonna be looking at um, some dollars on uh, the different technologies and such that um, make sure that we are getting those dollars to the people that who they say they are to reduce that fraud and quickly move that backlog through. Yeah, uh, We've got lots of questions for UIA of what was happening then, um, what was going on during that time period. We authorized over, I think, 500 new employees to hire up uh, quickly to help with that backlog, whether that actually happened or not. Um, so there's a lot of questions with UIA. Uh, I know I've talked about uh, the, the 21 day element. My understanding is um, UIA recently said they want to re-implement that in about a month or so uh, to get that qualification back up. So I know there's some movement on that. Um, but I have talked to a couple people of whether um, uh, the, we looked at it, whether we could put it within uh, the appropriations bill or whether it had to be a statutory. And we heard back that it needed to be a statutory. So it's something that we're continuing to talk uh, about and see whether that, uh, that fits in. But my understanding is they said uh, this week that they were looking to re-implement that by the, uh, uh, I think in May. Mid-May. Putting the, so they were putting the systems together to be able to do that with in a month, right? So that would, and that's a good thing. And, and I don't know that we know the details. Maybe, maybe George knows more about the details, but I wanted to add, um, you know, it's been frustrating for everyone, but I wanted to add our appreciation for what Michigan Works has done in filling in and being part of that, that huge increase in staffing. And in fact, not just part of it, but given that the folks at Michigan Works actually are so much more uh, qualified, you know, rather than just the people they were, we were hiring, you know, people from all over, trying to fill that, that gap and that huge workload, uh, but the Michigan Works folks have experience, and so that was a pretty significant contribution, um, and I don't know if you were appreciated enough for that, but, but I certainly appreciate it, uh, and, you know, the other thing is this, to, we do, we have had a couple of hearings, we have another hearing scheduled in the Senate with UI, so just to, to the representative's point, there is clearly work to be done in making things better. It was great to hear the announcement that there's gonna be a work requirement back. We are getting constant, now we get, I think, more complaints from employers who are trying to hire and nobody will apply and they can't get their employees to come back. So things are gonna shift so that we can start getting people back to work. Part of that is childcare, as we already discussed, right? People need to have a way to take care of their kids so they can go back to work. Um, but, but to put the work requirement back and the registration requirement back is a, is a good step forward. And hopefully other improvements um, as we come out of this. It's very hard to build systemic change in these massive systems in government in the middle of an emergency. 
And so trying to just bulk it up, right? And just get by has been a real challenge. So hopefully we will take the opportunity as we come out of it to do the things that we need to do to actually make it better for the future. George, do you know more about this? Well, I, I do know just a little bit that uh, UIA is expecting to put their enhanced phone system uh, into effect, I think in mid-May, and that should really help. Uh, and they're uh, really getting their return to work stuff um, geared up for, for mid-May. So uh, I think we'll be in a, a, a much better position soon. You know, I'll say two things. One, you know, we're state government and state government agencies and, and state government agencies, the way that we're funded, you know, is to do the work on hand. It's not like you have a lot of extra cash. And, uh, you know, with budgeting purposes and, and budget constraints, um, you know, something like a pandemic occurs and what happened with that, uh, understandably, things are going to go sideways pretty quickly. And I am very proud of uh, our folks at UIA who did their best to keep afloat and uh, handle that situation, that major influx of folks filing for unemployment as well as they could. And uh, on top of that, I think they, they handled that with as much style and grace as was possible in that situation. As most of us, I think that so many of us, you know, really answered the bell when it came to the challenges brought forward by the pandemic. Uh, our legislators provided great leadership in as much of a flexible manner as they could, um, you know, help to support uh, as much as possible. And, you know, our agencies did our best to continue to assist the state with considerable challenges. So, uh, and a part of that, you know, to echo uh, Senator Baer, uh, I think MWAs did a really amazing job of coming through and providing assistance as well. Uh, that was critically needed at a, at a very critical time. Uh, when it comes to these programs, I know that we've had a number of conversations related to this and uh, there are a lot of con uh, concepts under consideration and we're continuing to work on those. Um, I think right now Michigan might be the only state that requires in-person in registration. I'm not sure that's what some of the information that I was provided. Uh, I'll say to, you know, to echo something uh, Representative Van Workham said, you know, about that technology perspective and getting things done. I think one of the things the pandemic has taught us is the need to provide the easiest method of servicing our clients, right? I come from Toyota. I, I worked for Toyota prior to coming here. And something that was really drilled into us was service to the customer. But we had a different definition of customer. It wasn't just the person coming to buy the car. The customer was the next person in line, no matter where you were, you know? So if you're in our office, the next person next to me who I'm working on a, pro a project with might be my customer. If I'm, you know, dealing with a legislative item with Representative Van Workham and the way I handle, you know, my shop, I might see Representative Van Workham as my next client and trying to do my best to service his needs and make sure that he's as prepared as he can be. And I think uh, for uh, these services, we have to look at all those folks who are coming to the table looking for work and looking for those services as clients, right? And if we have that mindset, then that's the best way that you can service somebody and provide the services that they need. Uh, and a part of that is really making sure that we have very efficient and effective services in place, use of good technology. I mean, you know, no one here uses a fax machine anymore, right? I mean, that's, you know, in line with back to the future type stuff, right? Like, <laughs> I don't know the last time I used a fax machine. Uh, and if we're not providing easy services like e-signature and electronic, electronic filing of documents or you know, easy ways to go online and to sign up for programs and services, then you know, we're talking about 1990s level services versus you know, 2021. So I would say you know, anybody who's really relying on those, like you're basically going the way of the Pony Express. I mean, just a couple steps behind there. So, as we're looking at all of this, how do we service all those who are in need? Uh, I think the administration is sensitive to making sure that those services are provided effectively, efficiently, and making sure that they have the most impact so that there are no gaps in service or lost opportunities to provide that critical assistance needed for those who are unemployed, looking for services, looking for assistance, and looking for work. The, the one thing I want to add to, to this discussion is one of the frustrations I hear from businesses. Unemployment insurance agency is funded by businesses, right? They're assessed uh, on their payroll. In the state, um, five years ago, I believe, um, probably more at this point, um, I believe we had to bond out basically to bail out our uninsurance employment agency and, and the funds and the trust fund uh, within it that put even a higher assessment on businesses. So when they see the fraud that happened of basically in their mind, they paid, they paid for that, whether 
an employee, uh, we, you know, I hear of the, the employee employer that hasn't had to pay an uh, un, unemployment insurance because he's never had to fire an employee uh, before. Um, they see that and get very frustrated and see the inefficiency in that system and become very frustrated because they see it as their dollars that have funded it. And having gone from a multi-billion dollar trust fund, which they had to build up and now seeing it back to, I think about $500 million, um, which won't last the state very long. Um, you gotta keep that in mind. Uh, as, as you're dealing with, with this agency uh, and how, they're do how they are using those dollars. So uh, not a lot of people kind of know that or put that together. Um, so I think it's important to, to mention to the conversation. Thank you, Representative and the entire panel for your insights on that. So one specific insight I would also like to share with the panel is that our, our concern about the registration work registration at Michigan Works is that it is our job to help them get reemployed sooner, correct? And so um, when, when they have to register for work at Michigan Works, it provides us with an initial contact with them. And, and again, we, we support the technology improvements in the, in, in the potential of, of allowing this virtually. But again, a connection with Michigan Works would help them move more quickly into a job seeking and job search mode. and allow us to assist them with, with our expertise and our connections with employers. So just to uh, focus on that specific point, wanted to make sure we understood our concern. So, and of course we all wanna, and, and, and representative in the context of the unemployment insurance fund, sooner we get them employees, right? The lower the, the liabilities are to that fund. So, all right, very good. Um, shall I move on to another subject or does the panel have any other thoughts or comments on that? No, I did just want to say thanks to everybody who's been dropping stuff in the chat. I just try to pop on it and, and check out what everybody's saying. And that's a lot of, uh, of great additional insight. So thank you for that. Yeah, all right, very good. So the next question is, um, there are many families seeking cash assistance face significant bar barriers in securing and retaining employment. Michigan Works is advocating for continued funding for the PATH program as are we, are, we are able to use it to connect workers who are very much at risk of dropping out of the workforce over the long term, lifting them into jobs that are right for them and helping strengthen our state's talent pipeline. What do you anticipate in fiscal year 2022 budget for the PATH funding? I'll just start really quickly and say again, this is another area where you know we're really uh, appreciative of everything that the MWAs do in this area. Uh, so I just wanted to say that. And currently the governor's budget recommendation uh, keeps PATH funding consistent with last year. So that's where we are in our end. And the Senate concurred with that too. Hopefully the, the we'll see the same kind of thing coming from the house. But I personally am really uh, in favor of this program having, you know, like after my corporate jobs and starting a small company working with nonprofits, um, just being involved in uh, helping people move to some kind of sustainable self-sufficiency uh, path programs, like and anything like that, they're the kinds of things that actually can help people continue to move forward instead of, you know, we, we, we have a tendency to just hear some help and then disappear and no, nothing works that way, especially what we've seen recently, right? A crisis happens, you need to be able to still continue and step in and out as needed to move forward in your path to self-sufficiency. So I'm a huge proponent of that and appreciate all the work that you guys do with the partnership. Yeah, my understanding is the PATH program is pretty much funded by the federal government. So I believe we concurred with, with the recommendation from the governor uh, and last year's funding. But uh, yeah, I echo some of the other comments. Um, and in, in your comments from the, the last discussion, yes, it's about getting people to work. Um, the best, uh, the best um, government, um, I forget, I forget the saying, it, I blanked for a second there, but the best uh, uh, government program is getting people 
to work or the best welfare program is getting people with a sustainable, consistent paycheck. Uh, that is the best poverty program. Um, and that's what we need to be focused on in helping people transition. Um, that's one of the reasons why I focused on child care. It's getting that, um, that, uh, uh, getting that uh, when you look at poverty and statistics, it's often the, the single mother. Mm -hmm. You need to get her in that entry level job and see that path and growth um, and that path to prosperity. So programs like this of trying to get that transition, trying to get people into work uh, and then uh, building, building from there. So that's, that's always been my focus. Well, great. And to, to reinforce that Michigan Works role in that process is to um, help remove their barriers for work and or for training. And, and um, we very much uh, have a lot of success stories, by the way, in that space. It's, it's, it's one of our most gratifying programs on a personal level to see folks who are literally felt they had no future move into a um, potential um, career opportunity. So we appreciate very much your support for that program, folks. Thank you very much. So um, uh, next question, um, there are several workforce programs spread across state government. The Michigan Works Network believes the best place for workforce de de development programs is within the Michigan Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity. With this change, Michigan Works would be able to coordinate with a single entity when engaging with the state. What's the panel's ideas on this or thoughts on this idea? <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll start by saying that we know that consolidation has happened with uh, a number of workforce development programs, and we want to continue to explore those efficiencies and ways that we can have system improvement. So I think it's something that is definitely worth looking at. I think it's worth a dialogue among all the stakeholders. Um, you know, consolidation for consolidation's sake isn't always the best thing, but if you can make sure that the needs of everybody who needs to be serviced, again, your customers, is taken care of uh, effectively, then, and you can find those ties, uh, I think that's always good. And I'm always in favor of less government whenever we can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Except for the jobs part, right? We need all those people working. <laughs> no, yeah. anything that makes it, we make it more efficient, but we do have to make sure that we can, we can still do the job, as George said. Sure. Right. This, this was something I, worked on when I worked for Congressman Hookstra and he was part of the Education Workforce Committee out in, in DC. And it was kind of always frustrating with WIA um, and um, some of the trade programs of all the different workforce programs that we had. It just got confusing for people of well, was my job lost because of trade or was it lost because of this? And then you, you're allowed to be funded because this is how you lost your job or this is what education level you have. It just, it just, we had a program for basically every socioeconomic group, every, whether you were a veteran, whether you were a senior, it, it just, it became confusing, which was probably one of the reasons for a uh, Michigan works to emerge. Um, so we were doing a hearing recently. And I asked for all the different programs and I think it was like 26 or so different educational workforce development programs just within uh, the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity. So that's not even including MDE or DHHS, or maybe corrections that has a, mm -hmm. a, a program. Um, so it and is the county ones. You can throw that in there too, right? right. All the county programs is so confusing. Yeah. So yeah, and it's confusing, and, and that's why Michigan Works is is here to to help smooth some of that for for people. Um, but it's something that I'm very curious in of taking a look at of how to simplify this because there are programs available. If you are interested in improving and gain more training, starting a new job, there, there's a lot of dollars available. It's often a question of how to access it. Um, but I do think we got to make it simpler for, for folks and frankly, for you guys as well and for the state and for, for our budgeting. Because when you look at that, every time you have another program, 
you basically have another administration or another bureaucracy or FTEs associated with it um, that that's less dollars for actually benefiting the people that need it. So um, I've uh, actually talked to my local uh, Michigan Works uh, about this and have asked um, to begin looking at this element, see if there's some, some efficiencies that we can create. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your, all of your perspectives and, and I'm pleased to, 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 and you probably are aware that with Project Clean Slate, the uh, Leo has connected Michigan Works to mm -hmm. that, providing funding for expungement navigators at, at each of the Michigan Works agencies. And that's literally just getting off the ground in, in, in this past week and, and will be more broadly publicized. But um, we think that will be great for uh, uh, improving uh, prospects for individuals to uh, pursue a career pathway but equally important to address the talent shortage that employers are experiencing. So it's a great program. And again, we're pleased that, that the choice has been made to run that through Michigan Works. So thank you very much. So we're getting to the end of our hour here. Is there any additional topics or comments or thoughts that any of the panel wanna share with the group? I'll go first. Sure. Um, I think, uh, you know, I keep I keep getting all kinds of really interesting conversations and that's good because it's optimistic coming out of the pandemic, uh, but it's always about jobs and how are we going to find the people? How are we going to find the people to do all of this infrastructure work that we're going to have? We're getting this big boost from the federal government we know is coming, um, even just in the, the grant that's like going to be in the door next week kind of thing, the ARP the next one is going to be even bigger and where are we going to get those skilled folks right well, this is going to be critical for us to start to focus as much as we can on getting people moved to the places where we can do those roads and bridges and cables right we're going to do all this internet work we're going to do you know towers we're going to do you know we're going to need all of that at the same time like we mentioned i mentioned electrification right we have this high tech thing that's happening and the rate of change is accelerating in technology. So between things that are happening automotive wise, electrification, electrification is happening all over the place. But the, the rest of it is anything having to do with security online is a massive a challenge for us. We have not even begun to step up to that and um, artificial intelligence and you know other things that have to do with really super high tech stuff. That's a major hole for us and it's going to get bigger and bigger all the time. So so as we you know, look to the immediate, I'm like this year, we're gonna start needing all this infrastructure and a lot of skilled trades. We also need to start thinking about the, the next piece that's sitting right in front of us is this high tech stuff and what can we do with technology training, right? So you guys are a huge piece of this. I just gotta say, I, <laughs> and, and then folks that have, I've worked with at Michigan Works know what a fan I am, but you have just the proven capability of taking people forward in all kinds of ways. And so I'm hoping that we're gonna be able to lean on you even more as the, the rate of change continues to accelerate and our need grows greater. And you know, Senator, I would encourage um, you and, and, and the representative that as you deal with uh, employers or sec industry sector groups, encourage them to work with us so we can more efficiently you know, target our funds to their needs. Um, you know, we, high, we are required uh, to only we only allow funding for high demand occupations, but if it's that information about what is high demand now and into the future is empowered by industry input, it's far more accurate and helpful to them. So um, please encourage them to work with us with with industry sector groups. So thank you. You bet. I, I say it all the time, and I will continue. Thank you, Representative. Was there anything else you wanted to say or close with? Um. Yeah. I guess when I think about these these issues and think about where we are currently, um, and and the and the senator is right. There's going to be a, a high demand here, whether it's just the natural economy bouncing back from uh, a recession or just the federal enormous amount of federal dollars that are now being pumped into uh, the states, let alone. Loan Michigan. Um, we can debate whether it was needed or not. We can have that philosophical debate. But uh, uh, it, either way, it's 
it's about getting people to understand the value of work um, and the respect of work. And sometimes that gets drowned out, but it was kind of what I was alluding to earlier of getting that first job uh, and then building your path to prosperity, climbing that economic ladder. That's why I think of childcare as a, 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 not a poverty program, but a, a way to, to get out of um, poverty because you're, you're getting into that work and you see the value in work and value in work isn't just a paycheck. It creates for many an identity, uh, it creates that relationships, it creates that network that will expand and, and uh, give you more opportunities. So yeah, we need, we need to train our workforce. I think there's there is lots of dollars available for that, but it's also that self-motivation too, uh, to go out there, seek it, um, and then uh, seeing that that value of work and moving forward. So that's kind of what I, I focus on. I think there's gonna need to be some of that as we continue to have the debate on unemployment. And right now it's, um, I believe $33,000 a year you can make not working and being on unemployment. And how does a business compete against that? And I think that's one of the issues we're struggling with to figure out how to get people back into that workforce. And that's why I talk about the value of work. It's not just about paycheck, but it's also the relationships. It's also that self-worth um, and these other um elements that you don't just associate with with a paycheck and that's going to be important i think it's something we need to talk about uh now uh in the next couple months too to get people back on the rolls and moving our economy forward thank you good words of wisdom representative appreciate it george was there anything else you wanted to say well, again, thank you all for uh, allowing me to be here today and uh, to participate in this panel. Uh, Senator Baer, Representative Van Workham, uh, our great legislative partners. Uh, I appreciate and respect their vision, all the work that they put in uh, specifically in this area. Uh, so it's an honor for me to, to participate in this discussion with them and, and be along with you. Uh, a, a boss I had who I like to quote very often, uh, he always said, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste, right? And I think that we're all in this situation now where we've had the crisis of crises, you know? Uh, and it's an opportunity for us to stop and reflect. And although, and I know this is so cliche to say, but you know, uh, problems present opportunities. And uh, we know the problems <laughs> that we've had over the last year plus. Uh, we're at a stage right now where we have a clear pathway out. We see this, you know, from our federal level leadership, from our state level leadership, all the way down through local, through the agencies and through all these different groups that are working very hard, not only to have kept us afloat throughout the, the pandemic, but are now seeing the horizon uh, along the way and, and seeing the sun come up. So, and knowing it's gonna be you know, basically the start of a new day for us. Uh, so to the representative's point, we know that there's a large influx of federal dollars. You know, We could debate the philosophy behind that all day long, but we know it's there. We have an opportunity to take those dollars and to do something visionary. We can look back and just say, okay, maybe we just, you know, take all this money and get everybody back to where they were, you know, prior to the pandemic or something along those lines. That's something that can be done, but like that doesn't represent growth at all in any way, shape or form. You know, think about muscles. How do muscles grow? You, you work them till they literally tear, then they build upon themselves and they become stronger, better, bigger, right? And they work better. And I think that that's how, if we have that mindset of looking at what's been going on through this process, we've stretched ourselves to all of our very limits. We've gone as far as we could and we've exhausted ourselves in all of those different ways. So now let's not just try to go back to where we were before. You don't go through an experience like that just to be stagnant. How do we become better? How can we lead? How can we become visionary? How can we grow? How can we do trans transformational things right now? And if we had to deal with this last year plus of time, going through what we did to just come back and be the same old people we were the day before, that would be disappointing, right? I think we all owe it to all of ourselves to stop and take a few moments to say that we deserve better. We deserve greater. You know, can we come back and have more technology, better technology, find ways to be more efficient, find ways to be more effective, find ways to get people back to work, 
to Representative Van Workham's point, you know, let people feel good about themselves. We all deserve to feel good about ourselves. We all deserve, after what we all went through, we all deserve to wake up and feel proud to look in the mirror and to see that again, it's a new day, you know, so let's make this better. So I think, you know, these dollars that are coming in, let's look at great ways to invest, not to spend it. I don't want to just spend that money. I want to invest in it. So that it becomes investments in our future. Things that like building muscle, make us better, make us faster, make us stronger, make us more efficient. Uh, and I think that if we do that, if we have that focus, all of us working together, the executive, uh, the legislature, all of our partners out there, like Michigan Works, if we all are moving forward with that mindset, then we're going to come out of this. We're going to be telling really, really great stories, you know, like they used to tell when they came out of World War II and the Great Depression. That's our moment, you know, is this our, is this our moment to go into space? Can we become better as a people? Can we become better as a, as, as a state? Can we become provi better providing these services? So thank you. Well, thank you, George. I'm inspired by the common aspirations of the three panelists and, and you did a great job. I wanna thank you for sharing your personal stories, knowledge and thoughts with us today. I think it was a very informative and, and engaging discussion. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate it. Have a great it. weekend, everyone. Thank you all so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.